Hi, I'm Tony DeMario from UC San Diego. On, I'm here in San Francisco at the TCT meeting, uh, again to bring you some highlights of the late-breaking clinical trials. And to do this, we have two super experts, Deepak Bhatt, uh, to, uh, to my left from Harvard, and the editor of the of Jack Interventional Cardiology, Dr. Spencer King. So I, I guess, uh, Deepak, uh, the most interesting trial uh, in the last session was Chill MI. Yes, this was a very interesting study examining hypothermia in myocardial infarction patients. Of course, hypothermia has become very popular in cardiac arrest, both in terms of trying to prevent heart muscle damage and brain damage. But this study was looking at patients just coming in with an MI, not necessarily those uh, in extremis, and the primary endpoint was infarct size, to see if hypothermia would reduce the size of infarcts. And they did hypothermia by an endovascular procedure, uh, the primary endpoint being infarct size. Uh, uh, what did they find? Let's get right down to the bottom line. Sure. So um, a little bit disappointing for the primary endpoint, no significant difference in infarct size. It was 13% lower in the hypothermia group, but that wasn't statistically significant in the overall trial, so strictly speaking negative. But in the subgroup of patients with anterior MIs uh, treated within four hours, so big MIs getting to them soon enough, there was a significant reduction in that subgroup, albeit not in the overall trial. Yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, difficult often logistically, isn't it, Spencer, to uh, get to these patients with acute MI when everything else is going on, PCI and whatnot, and, and to do the endovascular cooling? Yeah, I mean, you, the people who are getting cooled are the people who uh, are out cold, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> that is, the people who've had, uh, who are unconscious, who've had, you know, had a rest or something. You know, we're not doing cooling, you know, right now. So it's an interesting experiment to see if cooling would have a benefit in people just with big MIs. So I think the, the you know, the question is still out there, apparently, that uh, this uh, doesn't settle it. Uh, and, well, and, was, and it won't settle it either because, interestingly enough, in a very small subgroup of patients who died, uh, the cooling actually seemed to produce a mortality benefit. Sure. So there was a reduction in heart failure uh, with the uh, hypothermia. Now, the number of events is low, so the composite of death or heart failure was two events versus eight events. So statistically speaking, it's not a robust finding, but the p-value was less than 0.05 for that. So I think it does generate some excitement. I mean, this was really a small pilot study, but I think it leaves open the door for a larger clinical outcome trial to see if hypothermia really reduces important clinical events. Such when, you as say, heart when you say it's uh, hard to do, yeah, it'd be hard to do. But of course, if you did generate heart data that said you were really benefiting people, I think we could find technologies that would get it done. Uh, right. I'm, I'm sure we could. And, and uh, for me, simplistically, if I see heart events are four times uh, more frequent in the patients in the control group than right. the treated group, I say, gosh, that might be worth pursuing. Yes. Because infarct size, of course, as we all know, <laughs> is uh, uh, something, it lacks some precision. Right. But the heart failure finding, I agree, it's very intriguing. Yeah. Well, uh, another very interesting study was additional data on this heart flow methodology for measuring FFR uh, by CT uh, angio. Uh, you know, that the initial study was positive, but uh, leaving a certain amount of, of uh, inaccuracy that that raised questions. So they've enhanced uh, the algorithm and uh, they've been much more specific about the technique of obtaining CT angios. Uh, and so with this new methodology, they went ahead and, and uh, saw how well the CT FFR correlated. Uh, what did you think of that study? I, I think the data for uh, that whole imaging modality looks terrific. I mean, it seems like it's very promising. Invasive FFR, of course, has taken off uh, and, and has been shown to be really valuable in determining which lesions should be treated versus which shouldn't. And I think the idea of being able to do things non-invasively really takes it to a whole new level. So I'm really yeah. excited about that. And of course, the bane of, of uh, CT angio has been the calcified lesion, and 
And uh, the overestimation, actually, typically of the severity of lesions uh, or, or just the inability to even make a quantitative assessment of many lesions by CT. And so the question they asked was, between the visual assessment and this uh, non-invasive FFR, um, it could could they more accurately predict what the classic FFR invasively uh, obtained would be? And uh, they got a benefit. Um, I guess that would be a value in, in determining which patients to move on toward uh, cath and intervention. Yeah, you know, anything that improves the uh, precision of understanding uh, the the severity of lesions, uh, whether the lesion is uh, cr uh, important, and whether, f more importantly, whether fixing the lesion or, or opening it or stenting it or bypassing it is really going to produce a result. Th this is all progress, but I, I think it's still a work in progress because uh, we know that measured, invasive measured FFR has been shown to improve our, our overall outcomes if we act on that evidence. Uh, the, the golden chalice would be to somehow have a non-invasive box you get into. It tells you anatomy, it tells you your physiology, it tells you the result you'll have once you're fixed. And so this would be a great dream, but uh, it's, uh, and, and it's, it's exciting and it, we should be uh, following this very closely. Yeah, and our, our screening techniques clearly have been imperfect. Lots and lots of patients going to cath who don't have obstructive disease that warrants revascularization. But in terms of FFR, there sure are a lot of patients right around 0 0.8 that, <laughs> that give you gray hairs when you're trying to decide what to do. Yeah, I think the important thing is that we understand that it's a guide. It's, it's part of the evidence. It's not, and so uh, if people get confused that they think uh, 0.81, you do one thing, 0.79, you do, forget it. I mean, because you measure it again, it's gonna go the other way. So it, it helps you, but it, it's, it's not a uh, dichotomous uh, decision maker for you. You still have to think. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I'm glad I'm not the only one that always seems to get an FFR of 0.82 when somebody is kind of squirrely chest pain and then you're just as stuck now as you were before. Uh, but, uh, but I think improvements in the technology like this, coupled with future outcome studies to show that this data is actionable in some way, uh, that's how the field's moving. Yeah, I ascribe to the King approach. If, if I have a patient that I don't think needs something and they call me up with an FFR of 0.78, I tell them to measure it again a couple of times. <laughs> until they yeah, keep get, measuring until you get the yeah, answer you want. Keep, keep gets, getting something that goes along with the patient I'm seeing in front of me. Uh, I, I guess a word about advice size two uh, is in order, and that's the instantaneous FFR, the uh, uh, approach where uh, adenosine is not needed in the hopes of making it an easier procedure that people would do more frequently. Yeah, I, I think the idea of simplifying FFR is good, though in all honesty, I don't think FFR as it is right now is that complex. I mean, just an adenosine infusion is not such a big deal. But uh, if we could, in a percentage of patients, not have to go ahead and give adenosine, yeah, that would make things simpler. I, I think the field remains pretty controversial, though, in terms of how much this technique really adds. That is, is it good enough for prime time? Yeah. Spencer, what's your feeling about the instantaneous FFR? I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think it's, it comes close to the same thing you get. But uh, contentious is a good word. I, to me, the, the, one of the main uh, side effects is We've got real discussions at the meetings now <laughs> that we used to have years ago where people get right uh, serious about the <laughs> confrontation. But uh, aside from that, I think it's, uh, you know, I need to know more about it. I, I, I clearly uh, understand the, the uh, adenosine FFR. It's like measuring the gradient across an aortic valve, or increasing the output. Uh, that, that's very clear. Gradients of that sort are very clear to me. Uh, the instantaneous FFR is uh, uh, a little more esoteric and to understand, and, uh, but uh, the evidence is that it, you, you get pretty darn close to the s similar uh, findings. Yeah, and we, we published a lot on IFFR and uh, just recently uh, accepted a manuscript where a number of investigators pooled their data together, and the answer was, just as you say, it comes close, but the real issue, is it close enough? Is it good enough that you can really act on it? And uh, 
at least my read on it at the moment is that the answer is not yet. Uh, yeah, I agree clinically, though I think from a research perspective, it's terrific that so many investigators are thinking about physiology again, you know, not just focusing on the anatomy. Yeah. So, uh, a positive news about CTFFR, um, some additional information about instantaneous FFR, and uh, negative information, I guess, uh, uh, about cooling in the setting of, of acute MI, at least with regard to overall infarct size. Uh, many more very interesting late-breaking clinical trials uh, soon to come. Stay with us. Mm -hmm.